everybody, I'm Beth Davis and welcome to Teachable Tuesday. We are making our way through the Gospel of John and today, finally, we've arrived. John 15, one of my favorites. So grab a Bible, we're gonna read, we're gonna pray together, we're gonna share our takeaways. It's gonna be like a good old, good old fashioned Bible study. Okay, let's pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen, come Holy Spirit. Jesus, we love you, we welcome you, we praise you, and we thank you for your goodness, for your kindness, for your presence here with us. Send us your Holy Spirit afresh, Lord. Help us to see your face, to hear your voice. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You can wait. Amen. So, you can wait, baby. I'm just going to wait one second. You can talk to ID if you want. I'm going to talk to you while I'm waiting for it to go live, for us to have sound <laughs> right, on Facebook. Are we back? Is it time? Friends, we're going to read John 15 today, and uh, I'm going to read it to you. Isn't it nice when people read scripture? You could just like soak in it. I did that last night. Thank you, Father Mike Schmitz. Um, so we're going to read and pray John 15, and I want you to stay attentive, as always, to those interior movements of your heart. What's your one thing? What's your takeaway? because God is speaking to you. The word of God is living and active. So he's alive and he's speaking to you in the word in John 15, here and now, grab a Bible and share your takeaway, share your one thing in the comments below. I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I'm giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. If you belonged to the world, the world would love you as its own. Because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, servants are not greater than their masters. 
If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But they will do all these things to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not have sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. It was to fulfill the word that was written in their law. They hated me without a cause. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So a few years ago, uh, I was in a bit of a crisis. I had been a youth minister for a number of years, many years, a lot of years in terms of the typical lifespan of a youth minister. And I was really feeling like it was time for a change, like God might be preparing me to do something else, go somewhere else. And uh, so I sort of followed that um, call that uh, prompting and I found and interviewed for a job in another state and even though I didn't think it went particularly well I was surprised at the end of the weekend interview that they offered me the job and so I was really thrown I was a bit like off kilter I I wasn't expecting things to go that way I I didn't think there would be anything to discern And so when I went to the airport to go home, I was very disoriented and feeling pretty unsettled and very alone. I'm running through all of these options and ideas. I'm trying to pray, but I'm so anxious and confused. I sat at the gate feeling pretty despondent. Now, all of these things to a person who's trained in discernment would be, you know, kind of made aware of some of those movements and say, hey, maybe that wasn't what the Lord was up to. But alas, I was sitting at the gate, feeling very anxious, very confused and alone. And I was just crying out in my heart to the Lord. I don't know what to do. I don't know what the right thing to do is. And lo and behold, walking out of the gate off of the plane that I would soon be boarding was my best friend from high school's dad. And we couldn't believe that we were running into each other in another city. It was so random and uh, came over to give me a hug and I just started crying. I was so overwhelmed by the generosity of God, the provision of God that he would send a father to me in that moment. And suddenly I didn't feel so alone. And I I wonder if you've ever felt uh, overwhelmed, anxious, confused, alone, just really lonely. Maybe it's in your circumstances. Maybe it's interiorly. Have, Have you ever felt that way? What happened? Who showed up for you in that moment? Was it in college when You didn't know anyone, you you maybe weren't clicking with your roommate and you went to to eat in the cafeteria and, and found a person to sit with. Maybe it's in your marriage, you feel lonely, you're hurting, you're not sure who or or where to turn, you're just missing your spouse in this season. Perhaps it, it is more interior, it's mental or it's emotional, this anguish, this loneliness and so you're feeling very isolated because who can understand those inner workings of our hearts and minds maybe that's an experience in the past or maybe that's how you're feeling right now confused anxious alone but you know this morning when i was praying with john 15 i just asked the lord something i do sometimes when i give a talk especially when i don't really know where to land I said, Jesus, what do you want to tell them? And he said, you are not alone. You are not alone. I believe that the Lord is speaking that word to you 
personally, in your circumstance, in your experience, in the depths of your heart, friend, you are not alone. That's the, the good news of the gospel. Really, the promise and the instruction of John 15 is that you are not alone. So today, I, I want to zoom in in John 15 on my takeaway, my one thing, my verse, John 15, verse 4, abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Abide in me as I abide in you. I want to focus first on, on the first part of that verse and then we'll come to the latter part of that verse in just a moment. Abide in me as I abide in you. Don't miss that ver that word, that as. Don't put all of your effort on abiding in him. How are we supposed to do that? Well, we do it and we can do it because he abides in us. He's already with us. He is already with you, in you, by virtue of your baptism as a Christian. The most holy trinity, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, came to make his home inside of you. You are not alone. You are never alone because God lives in you. God dwells in you. God chose to make a home in you. God abides in you. What's another word? How can we understand this word abide? What does it mean to remain? He remains with you. He stays with you. He doesn't get busy or distracted. There's not something or someone in greater need. So he just asks you to hang on, to get in line, to wait your turn. No, he lives. He remains. He abides with you and in you. We uh, have to choose, however to abide. The same way that he lives in us, we have to choose, we have to remember to live, to remain, to abide in him. And we do that in the same way that he lives and abides with us. We give him everything. We give him our lives, every moment, every circumstance. Now, this happens gradually. <laughs> this happens little by little, just yes by yes. We give him more real estate in our souls. We give him more domain in our work, in our relationships, our big V vocation, our little V vocation. We give him more and more. As he lives in us, we endeavor to give him more of us. Now, John 15 is both very poetic and extremely practical. The language alone moves you, doesn't it? This image of of God as the vine dresser, Jesus as the vine, and we are the branches. But a little context. If you were to read John 15 as a good Jew in the time of Jesus, all of this imagery, all of this language about vineyards and vines, it would harken back to the Old Testament, to the Old Covenant, where God spoke through his prophets and, and he likened his people, Israel, his chosen people, to a vineyard. He himself has always been the vine dresser. He's the owner of the vineyard. He chose this vineyard and he keeps, he cultivates this vineyard. So when we read this, we're reading it with those Old Testament eyes. We're reading it with um, that historical context, understanding that we are the branches. Jesus makes it very plain. I am the vine, you are the branches. So what does that mean if, if God is the vine dresser and Jesus is the vine and we are the branches? We'll follow it through, follow that poetry. It says that in order to bear more fruit, in order to bear much fruit, we have to be pruned. How practically? We're cleansed. We're cleansed by the word. He prunes away every branch in him that bears no fruit. Now, why practically does a vine dresser cut away branches that do not bear fruit? 
Well, they sap all of the energy from the vine. They're taking up that lifeblood, that life source from the vine, but not producing any fruit, so they need to be cut away. This is true in us. Jesus, our vine, is pumping this lifeblood into us through prayer, through the sacraments. And so, in his goodness, the vine dresser's mercy and love, he cuts away those things in us that don't bear fruit. He wants us to abide, to not be scattered and distracted, to not be growing all kinds of branches in all these different directions. He wants to pump his very life into us so that we might bear fruit. How? How do we do that except to stay connected to Jesus the vine? We're gonna talk about that in just a moment. We're gonna stay connected to Jesus the vine in prayer and in the sacraments. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it abides in me, neither can you unless you abide in me. We have to abide in him if we want to bear fruit. We have to remain in him. We have to make our home with him. We have to identify more with Jesus than with the world. We have to identify more with Jesus than with any other person. Identify more with Jesus, be more connected to Jesus, even than to our own will, to our own desires. Abide in me as I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. There it is again. You weren't meant to do this alone. You actually can't bear fruit alone. Unless you abide in the vine, you cannot bear the fruit that God intends for you to bear with your life. And as women, we bear such fruit for the kingdom. We reveal, we reflect the beauty of God. We bring life relationally. We, we bring literal life in our bodies. We sustain life in our bodies. We bring life into every situation, into every relationship as women. If we want to bring life, if we want to bear fruit, how do we do that? I'm gonna give you two ways very practically to abide in him so that you can bear fruit. First, make a commitment. Make a commitment. And two, mm, keep your commitment. So why make a commitment? Well, you may have heard this old adage, uh, fail to plan, plan to fail. I have many good intentions right, about what I'm gonna do with my afternoon, uh, about how I'm gonna be a person who gets up at a certain time of day, um, about uh, moving my body in a certain way, about reaching out to these certain people, about being a certain kind of friend, a certain kind of daughter, a lot of intentions. And yet, if, if I don't actually sit down with the Lord and share those intentions, those inspirations, with him, I'm doing it in my own strength. So make a commitment, tell Jesus everything. You're abiding in him, he's already with you. So tell him who you want to be, how you want to show up in the world, that you wanna be more like him, tell him. Tell him about that plan to get up at 5 a.m. God bless you, you go for it. Tell Jesus that you wanna do it and ask him to help you. Write it down, tell a friend, get some accountability, make a commitment. Don't think about doing it, but decide to do it. And in a particular way, I want to zoom in on making a commitment to prayer. To prayer. You've heard me in the past talk about Father Jacques Philippe, who um, he made a commitment to spend 15 minutes a day in prayer with God before the Blessed Sacrament. No matter what time he got home at night, no matter uh, if it was two in the morning and he hadn't made his 15 minutes, he would keep his commitment to that 15 minutes. He made a commitment. Now at the beginning of the year, for me, uh, the Lord really impressed this upon my heart to make a commitment. And I did so in a couple of ways. I kind of already had the spiritual practice of going to daily mass and uh, felt the Lord invite me to go to weekly confession. 
uh, a priest friend had, had challenged me and encouraged me to make a monthly desert day. And so I sat down with my planner, with my calendar, and I put in those commitments. I made a commitment to give Jesus my all, to show up. I wrote it down. And now to keep the commitment. Interestingly enough, I was very tempted this morning not to keep my commitment. And I thought, well, I'm going to be late for mass. Maybe I'll just go to the chapel. That's beautiful, right? That's prayer. I'm keeping a commitment. I'm like arguing with myself, asking the Lord to tell me what to do. And yet I I just really by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and, and God's help, I showed up to mass, even though I was late, even though I was embarrassed, I showed up to mass and suddenly rule five from St. Ignatius popped into my mind that we are in times of desolation, right? When I'm stressed, when I'm feeling discouraged, never to make a change. And so even though I didn't feel up to it, even though my anxiety was kind of all over the place, my emotions were roiling over, I kept my commitment and I went to daily mass. This is why it's so imperative that we make the commitment so that we have a commitment to keep. So what's the one thing? What's the one prayer commitment that God is bringing to the surface of your mind and heart right now. Maybe it's returning to confession. Maybe it's getting to the holy hour that you signed up for but you've been missing. Maybe it's one daily mass a week. Maybe it's just been a crazy season of life and you haven't been faithful to your daily commitment to read the scriptures and spend time with Jesus in prayer. Whatever's coming to mind, with God's help, talk to him about it and make a commitment again, reaffirm your commitment or maybe make a commitment for the first time to prayer and then tell someone so you have some accountability to keep your commitment. Friend, I want nothing more than for you to abide in Jesus because he already abides in you. I want your life to bear fruit because he alone is the one who can bring the fruit. So abide in him and see the fruit that comes. Let's pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit. We pause, we wait, O Lord, for your initiation, your invitation. How are you inviting us to abide in you? Lord, grant us the grace to hear that gentle voice inviting us to union and communion with you. Grant us the grace to write it down, Lord, to make a commitment. And even inspire a a friend, maybe our spouse, someone that we can share this commitment with, Lord can keep us accountable to to remaining with you. Thank you for remaining with us, Jesus, through it all. We place our trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, friends. See you next week for John 16. Bye now. Got it? John 16? My goodness. Friends, God bless you. Share your (laughs) takeaways with me. I would love to hear. Um, Right after we go live, uh, this goes up on the feed, so you can share your takeaways there. And surprise, look who's here. Jesus? Jenna. Jenna's here. here. (laughs) Jesus in Jenna is here, and we're going to do a little Q&A, so join us over on YouTube for that. Or the website? The website. Great. The website, too. Cool. All right. See you there.